In a town in the woods at the top of a hill, there's a house where no one lives. So you take a big bag of your big city money there and buy it. But at night when the house is dark and you're all alone, there's a noise upstairs. At the top of the stairs, there's a door and you take a deep breath and try it. Flashlight shows you something moving just inside the door. There's a tattered dress and a feeling you have felt somewhere before. And there's a creepy doll that always follows me. It's got a ruined eye. It's always open. And there's a creepy doll that always follows me. The Shadows on the Wall by Mary Wilkins Freeman Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Carolyn Glynn. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Ann Glynn gasped by way of assent. She sat in a wide flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Carolyn to her sister Mrs. Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn the one beauty of the family. The latter was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking chair with her superb bulk of femininity and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanor. But even her expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Carolyn's announcement and her sister Rebecca Ann's gasp of terror and distress in response. "'I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end,' she said with an asperity which disturbed the slightly roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. "'Of course he did not know,' murmured Rebecca Ann in a faint tone. "'Of course he did not know it,' said Carolyn quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange, sharp look of suspicion. Then she shrank, as if from the other's possible answer." Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs. Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in her chair. She had ceased rocking, and was eyeing them both intently with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. "'What do you mean?' she said impartially to them both. Then she, too, seemed to shrink before a possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. "'Nobody means anything,' said Carolyn firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. "'Where are you going?' asked Mrs. Brigham. "'I have something to see to,' replied Caroline, and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. "'Oh,' said Mrs. Brigham. After the door had closed behind Caroline, she turned to Rebecca. "'Did Henry have many words with him?' she asked. "'They were talking very loud,' replied Rebecca evasively. Mrs. Brigham looked at her, she had not resumed rocking. She still sat up straight, with a slight knitting of intensity on her fair forehead, between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair. "'Did you... ever hear anything?' she asked in a low voice, with a glance toward the door. "'I was just across the hall in the south parlor, and that door was open and this door ajar,' replied Rebecca with a slight flush. "'Then you must have... I couldn't help it. Everything?' Most of it? What was it? The old story. I suppose Henry was mad, as he always was, because Edward was living on here for nothing when he had wasted all the money father left him. Rebecca nodded with a fearful glance at the door. When Emma spoke again, her voice was still more hushed. I know how he felt, said she. It must have looked to him as if Edward was living at his expense, but he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And Edward had a right here according to the terms of father's will, and Henry ought to have remembered it. Yes, he ought. Did he say hard things? Pretty hard from what I heard. What? I heard him tell Edward that he had no business here at all, and he thought he had better go away. What did Edward say? 
that he would stay here as long as he lived, and afterward, too, if he was a mind to, and he would like to see Henry get him out, and then... What? Then he laughed. What did Henry say? I didn't hear him say anything, but... But what? I saw him when he came out of this room. He looked mad. You've seen him when he looked so. Emma nodded. The expression of horror on her face had deepened. Do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him? Yes. Don't. Then Carolyn re-entered the room. She went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning. It was a cold, gloomy day of fall, and she warmed her hands, which were reddened from recent washing in cold water. Mrs. Brigham looked at her and hesitated. She glanced at the door, which was still ajar. It did not easily shut, being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer. She rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud, which jarred the house. Rebecca started painfully with a half-exclamation. Carolyn looked at her disapprovingly. "'It is time you controlled your nerves, Rebecca,' she said. Mrs. Brigham, returning from the closed door, said imperiously that it ought to be fixed. It shuts so hard. "'It will shrink enough after we have had the fire a few days,' replied Carolyn. "'I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to Edward,' said Mrs. Brigham abruptly, but in an almost inaudible voice. "'Hush!' said Carolyn, with a glance of actual fear at the closed door. "'Nobody can hear with the door shut. I say again, I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself. I shouldn't think he'd ever get over it having words with poor Edward the very night before he died. Edward was enough sight better disposition than Henry, with all his faults. I never heard him speak a cross word, unless he spoke cross to Henry that last night. I don't know, but he did from what Rebecca overheard.' Not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and aggravating, sniffed Rebecca. What do you really think ailed Edward? asked Emma in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. You know Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs. Brigham hesitated a moment. "'Was there any talk of an examination?' said she. Then Carolyn turned on her fiercely. "'No,' she said in a terrible voice. "'No!' The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. "'It's Henry,' Rebecca sighed rather than whispered. Mrs. Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back when the door at last yielded and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs. Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face and only one small, uncovered, reddened ear as attentive as a dog's, and at Carolyn sitting with a strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly with a look of inscrutable fear, in defiance of the fear and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same hard delicacy of form and aquilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger and an almost boyish recklessness appeared in his face. He flung himself into a chair with a gesture which was bewildering from its incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs. Brigham. "'I declare, Emma, you grow younger every year,' he said. She flushed a little, and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise." "'Our thoughts today ought to belong with the one of us who will never grow older,' said Carolyn in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. "'Of course, we none of us forget that,' said he in a deep, gentle voice. "'But we have to speak to the living. And Carolyn and I have not seen Emma for a long time, and the living are as dear as the dead.' "'Not to me,' said Carolyn. She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. Henry looked slowly after them. 
Carolyn is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs. Brigham rocked. A confidence in him inspired by his manner was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he, it was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination? There was no need. I am perfectly certain as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham felt a creep, as of some live horror, over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. "'Where are you going?' asked Henry in a strange, breathless voice. Mrs. Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing which she had to do, some black for the funeral, and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Carolyn was there. She went close to her and took her hands, and the two sisters looked at each other. "'Don't speak. Don't. I won't have it.' said Carolyn finally, in an awful whisper. "'I won't,' replied Emma. That afternoon the three sisters were in the study. Mrs. Brigham was hemming some black material. At last she laid her work on her lap. "'It's no use. I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light,' said she. Carolyn, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca in her usual place on the sofa. "'Rebecca, you had better get a lamp,' she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk, her face showed her agitation. "'It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamp quite yet,' she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. "'Yes, we do,' returned Mrs. Brigham peremptorily. "'I can't see to sew another stitch.' Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently, she entered with a lamp. She set it on the table, an old-fashioned card table which was placed against the opposite wall from the window— that opposite wall was taken up with three doors. The one small space was occupied by the table. "'What have you put that lamp over there for?' asked Mrs. Brigham, with more of impatience than her voice usually revealed. "'Why didn't you set it in the hall and have done with it? Neither Carolyn nor I can see if it is on that table.' "'I thought perhaps you'd move,' replied Rebecca hoarsely. "'If I do move, we can't both sit at that table. Carolyn has her paper all spread around.' "'Why don't you set the lamp on the study table in the middle of the room? Then we can both see.' Rebecca hesitated. Her face was very pale. She looked with an appeal that was fairly agonizing at her sister Carolyn. "'Why don't you put the lamp on this table as she says?' asked Carolyn, almost fiercely. "'Why do you act so, Rebecca?' Rebecca took the lamp and set it on the table in the middle of the room without another word. Then she seated herself on the sofa and placed a hand over her eyes as if to shade them, and remained so. "'Does the light hurt your eyes, and that is the reason why you didn't want the lamp?' asked Mrs. Brigham kindly. "'I always like to sit in the dark,' replied Rebecca chokingly. Then she snatched her handkerchief hastily from her pocket and began to weep. Carolyn continued to write, Mrs. Brigham to sew. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again and turned again to her task. At last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly. She looked from the wall around the room, taking note of the various objects. Then she turned to her sisters. "'What is that?' said she. "'What?' asked Carolyn harshly. "'That strange shadow on the wall,' replied Mrs. Brigham. Rebecca sat with her face hidden. Carolyn dipped her pen in the inkstand. "'Why don't you turn around and look?' asked Mrs. Brigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way. "'I am in a hurry to finish this letter,' replied Carolyn shortly. Mrs. Brigham rose, her work slipping to the floor, and began walking round the room, moving various articles of furniture, with her eyes on the shadow. Then suddenly she shrieked out, "'Look at this awful shadow! What is it? Carolyn, look! Look! Rebecca, look! What is it?' All Mrs. Brigham's triumphant placidity was gone. Her handsome face was livid with horror. She stood stiffly pointing at the shadow. Then, after a shuddering glance at the wall, Rebecca burst out in a wild wail. Oh, Carolyn, there it is again! There it is again! 
Carolyn Glynn, you look, said Mrs. Brigham. Look, what is that dreadful shadow? Carolyn rose, turned, and stood confronting the wall. How should I know? She said. It has been there every night since he died, cried Rebecca. Every night? Yes. He died Thursday, and this is Saturday. That makes three nights, said Carolyn rigidly. She stood as if holding her calm with a vice of concentrated will. It, it, it looks like... Like... Stammered Mrs. Brigham in a tone of intense horror. I know what it looks like well enough, said Carolyn. I've got eyes in my head. It looks like Edward, burst out Rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear. Only... Yes, it does, assented Mrs. Brigham, whose horror-stricken tone matched her sister's. Only... Oh, it is awful! What is it, Carolyn? I ask you again, how should I know? replied Carolyn. I see it there like you. How should I know any more than you? It must be something in the room, said Mrs. Brigham, staring wildly around. We moved everything in the room the first night it came, said Rebecca. It is not anything in the room. Carolyn turned upon her with a sort of fury. Of course it is something in the room, said she. How you act? What do you mean talking so? Of course it is something in the room. Of course it is agreed Mrs. Brigham, looking at Carolyn suspiciously. It must be something in the room. It is not anything in the room, repeated Rebecca with obstinate horror. The door opened suddenly and Henry Glynn entered. He began to speak, then his eyes followed the direction of the others. He stood staring at the shadow on the wall. What is that? he demanded in a strange voice. It must be due to something in the room. Mrs. Brigham said faintly. Henry Glynn stood and stared a moment longer. His face showed a gamut of emotions. Horror, conviction, then furious incredulity. Suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room. He moved the furniture with fierce jerks, turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall. Not a line of its terrible outlines wavered. "'It must be something in the room!' he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash. His face changed. The inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident upon his face, until one almost lost sight of his lineaments. Rebecca stood close to the sofa, regarding him with woeful, fascinated eyes. Mrs. Brigham clutched Carolyn's hand. They both stood in a corner out of his way. For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed. <laughs> what an absurdity, he said easily. Such a to-do about a shadow. That's so, assented Mrs. Brigham in a scared voice which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. I think you have broken the chair that Edward was fond of, said Carolyn. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. Just as good as ever, he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. Did I scare you? he said. I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap to the bottom of a mystery, and that shadow does look queer-like, and I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to without any delay. You don't seem to have succeeded, remarked Carolyn dryly, with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptibly. Oh, there is no accounting for shadows, he said, and he laughed again. A man is a fool to try to account for shadows. Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room, but Henry kept his back to the wall, as did, indeed, the others. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk, her knees trembled so. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk, her knees trembled so. I can't sit in that room again this evening, she whispered to Carolyn after supper. Very well, we will sit in the south room, replied Carolyn. I think we will sit in the south parlor, she said aloud. It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold. So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper, his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study, 
The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs. Brigham rose, folded her rustling skirts compactly round her, and began tiptoeing toward the door. "'What are you going to do?' inquired Rebecca agitatedly. "'I'm going to see what he is about,' replied Mrs. Brigham cautiously. As she spoke, she pointed to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it had somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. Mrs. Brigham folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk with its swelling curves was revealed in a black silk sheath, and she went with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. In the south room, Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Carolyn sewed steadily. What Mrs. Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glynn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systematic passes and thrusts with an old sword which had belonged to his father, all over and through the intervening space. Not an inch was left unpierced. He seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light, and the shadow remained unmoved. Mrs. Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. Finally Henry ceased and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs. Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. "'He looked like a demon,' she said again. "'Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Carolyn? "'I don't feel as if I could stand much more.' "'Yes, there's plenty,' said Carolyn. "'You can have some when you go to bed.' "'I think we had all better take some,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'Oh, Carolyn, what?' "'Don't ask, don't speak,' said Carolyn. "'No, I'm not going to,' replied Mrs. Brigham. "'But—' "'Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, "'and the south parlor was deserted.' Carolyn called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room bringing the lamp. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He set it on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible, his fair complexion showed livid, and his blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took up the lamp and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the center table, and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again, he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his former frenzy. Nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table, and the shadow sprang out upon the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs. Spurgum and the other sisters, who could not sleep, heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast, Henry Glynn announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. "'How can you leave your patients now?' "'asked Mrs. Brigham wonderingly. "'I don't know how to, but there is no other way,' replied Henry easily. "'I have had a telegram from Dr. Mitford.' "'Consultation?' inquired Mrs. Brigham. "'I have business,' replied Henry. "'Dr. Mitford was an old classmate of his who lived in a neighboring city "'and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. "'After he had gone, Mrs. Brigham said to Carolyn that, after all, "'Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr. Mitford, "'and she thought it very strange.' "'Everything is very strange,' said Rebecca with a shudder. "'What do you mean?' inquired Carolyn. "'Nothing,' replied Rebecca. "'Nobody entered the study that day, nor the next. "'The third day Henry was expected home, "'but he did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. "'I call it pretty queer work,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'The idea of a doctor leaving his patients at such a time as this, "'and the idea of a consultation lasting three days!' There is no sense in it, and now he has not come. I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlor. There was no light in the study. The door was ajar. Presently Mrs. Brigham rose. She could not have told why, 
Something seemed to impel her, some will outside her own. She went out of the room, again wrapping her rustling skirts round that she might pass noiselessly, and began pushing at the swollen door of the study. "'She has not got any lamp,' said Rebecca in a shaking voice. Carolyn, who was writing letters, rose again, took the only remaining lamp in the room, and followed her sister. Rebecca had risen, but she stood trembling, not venturing to follow. The doorbell rang, but the others did not hear it. It was on the south door, on the other side of the house from the study. Rebecca, after hesitating until the bell rang a second time, went to the door. She remembered that the servant was out. Carolyn and her sister Emma entered the study. Carolyn set the lamp on the table. They looked at the wall, and there were two shadows. The sisters stood clutching each other, staring at the awful things on the wall. Then Rebecca came in, staggering, with a telegram in her hand. "'Here is a telegram!' she gasped. "'Henry is dead!' The Birthday Girl by Joey Camo from the book It's Too Late to Say I'm Sorry. Clara pulled on the full length nightgown that her nan had given her. She tied the cord around her waist and she did up every button right to her throat. It was ugly and yellow with age. It was tight at her breasts and it was unbearably hot. It made her nan happy. The stairs to the attic creaked, which was good. Nan was almost a hundred years old. The last thing Clara wanted to do was startle her. She walked as heavily as she could on the steps, almost stomping. At the top, Clara knocked on the door. There was no answer, and she knocked again. Her fist made no sound against the wood. It was too thick. She pushed the door open and leaned her head inward. Grandma, she said. It was darker in her great-grandmother's bedroom than it had been in the hall. Clara waited for her eyes to adjust. She listened for the rasp of the iron lung, but the room was quiet. Grandma? She pushed the door open further and stepped inside. What was that sound? It sounded like a mouse scratching, but it was too rhythmic. The rocking chair sat facing the television, but the volume on the television was turned off. The game show host was smiling and gesturing in silence. The chair was still. Clara crept forward, the nightgown brushing against her legs with each step. Nan was not in the bed. She wasn't sitting at the small table playing cards. She had to be in the rocking chair. But why was the TV turned way down? Now Clara could see her grandmother's shoulders in the chair. They were twitching in odd bursts, and the sound of mice was louder. It sounded like it was coming from the chair, and with every insistent scraping noise, her Nan's bone-thin shoulders would twitch and shake. Clara looked around for the iron lung. It sat in the corner of the room, dark. Grandma, did you forget to hook up your lung? There was no answer. Clara forced herself to move closer. Nan? Clara reached out her hand for her great-grandmother's shoulder, and when her fingertips brushed against the thin fabric of the old woman's nightshirt, the shoulder twitched again. Her Nan jumped up out of the chair with a holler. What in the name of God? What in the name of God? her nan said, pulling the earphones away from her ears. Clara's great-grandmother put her hand to her chest. Are you trying to kill me? The earphones were louder now, and Clara could hear the beat of drums and the twang of guitar. Nan reached out for the floor lamp and turned it on. Her breath was coming in rasps. One of the old woman's eyes was wide open and terrified. The other was squeezed shut, as always, like someone had poked her there. You weren't moving, Clara said. I have to be moving all the freaking time, Nan said. She shook her head and pointed at Clara. It's bad enough that you people wake me up every day and shove gerbil shavings down my throat. Now I'm not allowed to sit down for a break? I can't listen to my music in peace? God damn it. 
I was worried you were dead, Clara said. She wanted to shake the old woman. You scare me, you old freak. There was no reason for you to jump up like that. You knew I was coming up here. God damn it yourself. Nan smiled at that, and her squinty eye softened a little bit. It opened a little wider. How did she change her mood so quickly, Clara wondered. She remembered the first time she had blown up at her grandmother. She couldn't recall what it had been about, only that she had sworn a blue streak at her nan and stomped on the floor in anger. Afterward, the old woman had pulled Clara into a hug. I love you, Clara. You don't put up with anyone's bullshit, Nan had said. And why should you? You're my flesh and blood. Now Nan walked to the bed as best she now Nan walked to the bed as best she could. She staggered a bit on her bad leg, dragging it behind her. Clara knew better than to help her. Instead, she lifted the headphones and the player up off the floor. The thing was small and plastic and chrome. In Nan's room, it was out of place. The display glowed an unnatural blue beside all of the old polished wood. Clara found the off button and set it beside her great-grandmother's glasses on the table. It's my birthday tomorrow, Nan said. She patted the bed and then fluffed her own pillow. I have a present for you, she said. Your birthday isn't for two more days, Nan, Clara said. It isn't? Nan smiled for a moment and then frowned. She took Clara's hands in hers. I'm going to be 100 years old this year, she said. She turned to the window beside her bed and looked out. The moon was cut in two. Clara sat down on the bed beside her Nan. Sometimes Nan would stare out the window for an hour. She would forget where she was or what she'd been talking about. It was funny how quickly she could go from her cantankerous old self to this. Clara touched her grandmother's shoulder. Nan, she said. Do you want to play a game of chess? Her grandmother looked unsettled in the moonlight, her hair everywhere. Clara smiled and said, It might help you relax. She smoothed Nan's hair, and the older woman's face softened. Clara, Nan said, looking toward her. When is my birthday, Clara? Is it tomorrow? I have to give you something first. I can't forget. Two more days, Clara said. The day after tomorrow. Are you excited? She squeezed her grandmother's hand. I couldn't imagine living a whole century, the things you must have seen. Nan shook her head and lay back on the bed. She was muttering now. Ha, she said. There's no choice. You have to keep going and going. Everyone dies at 60 or 70. Everyone grows up, and you have a granddaughter, and she grows up, and she's beautiful, and you have a great-granddaughter. Babies have been babies. I wish you could all live to be a hundred, she said. Everyone. Nan closed her eyes, still holding Clara's hand, and she fell asleep. After a few minutes, Clara tucked her Nan's arm beneath the quilt. She pulled the blanket up to her neck, and she turned off one of the lights, and she turned off the television. In her own room downstairs, Clara unbuttoned the nightgown and pulled it up over her head. She draped it on the laundry hamper beside her dresser and fell back into bed, naked. Through the wall, she could hear Gordon playing his video games. Every once in a while, a thin scream would make its way through the wall, the sound of some young woman being murdered, and she would wonder again why her parents let him play such bloody games. It's not like there's sex in them, was her mother's response whenever Clara brought it up. Anyway, all boys like violence. It's natural. Clara didn't know what to say to that. Through the bed, she could hear the television downstairs. The floor shook with some explosion or other. That would be the movie that her mother and father were watching on full volume, the baby and his jumper on the floor between them. Clara rolled over her front and reached for the stereo. The angry riff of electric guitar washed over the screaming girls from the video games and the explosions from the television below. Clara climbed under the sheets and turned off the light on her bedside table. She closed her eyes and sent love up through the house to her great-grandmother. Two more days, Nan, she said. Then you'll be a century old. She let her mind drift with the angry music from her stereo. She fell asleep. Three hours later, she woke to a scratching sound. There was a mouse in the hallway, maybe. Her stereo was turned off and her door was wide open. Clara covered her breasts automatically. She climbed out of bed. In the hallway, she let her eyes adjust to the darkness. The sound was coming from her left. Nan was leaning down in front of Gordon's door. She was naked, like Clara, and in the darkness her white skin looked blue. It shone. Clara could just imagine how funny Gordon would think this was. 
a naked grandmother scratching at his door. Nan? Clara whispered. Her great-grandmother kept scratching, and Clara moved closer. She thought about grabbing a robe from her room in case Gordon did come out into the hallway. There was no way she was going to be caught naked in front of her 15-year-old brother. Nan, what are you doing? Clara said. The old woman kept scratching, and there was a clicking sound now, like metal on metal. Claire went back into her room and grabbed a sweater off the chair. She pulled it over her head. It hung low enough to cover everything, but just barely. It was warm and soft against her skin. Claire hadn't realized she was cold. She went back into the hall, and she took Nan's arm. Nan, she said. The old woman spun, suddenly, lifting her hand toward Claire like a claw. Clara caught the hand easily and gently. The fingers were wet. Three of Nan's nails were broken backward from the scratching. The fingers were bleeding. What are you doing, Nan, she said. You should be in bed. Did I kill him, Nan said. Her face was covered in tears. Am I dead already, she said. Clara stroked her great-grandmother's hand with her own and lifted the other hand. Two nails on that hand were broken, too. Their fingers slick with blood. The blood looked like ink in the dark. Today's my birthday, Nan said, letting Clara take her by the arm. They turned to leave, but the door to Gordon's room opened, and light flooded the hallway. What's going on, Gordon said. He stood in the door, and Clara could see another boy sitting on the floor in front of the television, playing video games with the volume turned off. Someone on the screen held an axe. The boy glanced back, and when he saw Clara standing in the hallway half-naked, he stumbled to his feet. Clara pulled the front of her sweater down and held it there. Is that your sister? The boy said to Gordon. He pushed into the hallway and smiled at Clara. He looked her up and down. Clara had one hand on her grandmother and the other hand holding the sweater. I'm Patrick, he said, offering his hand and gritting. Gordon grabbed his arm and shoved him back into the room. Get out of here, he said to Clara and closed the door. I don't feel any different, Nan said, as Clara walked her up the stairs. Clara considered taking Nan to the sink to wash and clip her broken nails, but they would do that in the morning when Nan woke up. Now it was best to get her to bed. I don't feel any different, Nan said again. It's not your birthday yet, Clara said. She pulled the quilt up to Nan's shoulders. One more day, Nan, and then it's your birthday. Then you'll be a hundred years old. Do you think it'll feel any different to be a hundred? Nan didn't answer. She closed her eyes and pulled the quilt closer. Clara leaned down to kiss her great-grandmother's cheek. It was like kissing the wings of a moth. Then Nan's eyes were wide open again, and she was digging her fingers into Clara's arm through the sweater. The nails that weren't broken bent back away from the skin. Clara, she said. Clara, I love you. Her face was so twisted that Clara let out a sob unexpectedly. She pulled her grandmother close and whispered she loved her too, again and again until Nan had fallen asleep. Her hand shook when she pulled the attic door closed behind her. In her bedroom, Clara left her sweater draped over the chair where she had found it. She would deal with the blood on the sleeve tomorrow. She crawled back into bed. The next morning, Nan didn't remember any of it. Clara helped her clip and clean the broken nails in the attic sink and she wrapped the fingertips in bandages. They sat and ate breakfast together at the small table. In the morning light, it seemed less inevitable that she would lose her grandmother. It's like eating wood chips, Nan said, pushing the bowl of cereal away. It comes out looking the exact same. Did you know that? I don't even know what's worse, the wood chips coming out or the wood chips going in. Clara pushed the bowl back toward her Nan. You have to eat more than that, Clara said. The doctor said that you have to make fiber your friend. The bowl was still three-quarters full of bran cereal. Her great-grandmother ignored her and stood. Her squinting eye was almost completely closed against the morning sun. Gordon made jokes sometimes about how she ought to wear an eye patch like a pirate. Clara smiled in spite of herself. I was 22 when my great-grandmother turned 100, Nan said. My whole family came, dozens of cousins and uncles, all piled under one roof. She dragged her foot over to the far wall and lifted a small chest table from behind the trunk. Help me with this, she said. Clara stood up and helped Nan move the table to the center of the room 
It was a celebration. Nobody could remember another Brunner reaching a hundred years old. Everyone was there. Nan's voice was quiet. It was a week-long party. That sounds amazing, Nan, Clara said. Nan shrugged. My great-grandmother took me aside the day before her birthday. She sat me down at her chess table. She made me play chess with her all the time back then. She said it kept the mind sharp. She pulled one of the chairs from the breakfast table and set it in front of the chessboard. Clara did the same. Is this the same table, she said. She smiled, picturing Nan as a young woman sitting above the chess pieces, her face furrowed in concentration. The young Nan of her imagination had a squinty eye, too. It gave her the appearance of genius and adventure like a pirate girl. No, Nan said. Your father got me this at a yard sale. My great-grandmother's table burned. Oh, said Clara. I'm sorry. She could hear feet on the attic stairs now, the click of high heels. It was Clara's mother, Karen. Nan looked up toward the door as Karen's head peeked into the view. Are you girls all done with breakfast? Karen said. I need to borrow Clara for a bit, Nan. Nan put her hand on Clara's shoulder. You'll come and see me tonight, she said. You promise you'll come. I always do, Clara said. She smiled, but Nan dug her fingers into Clara's shoulder, and she wouldn't let go. Clara put her hand over Nan's. Her great-grandmother's fingers were cold. I promise, she said. I'll see you tonight, before bed. We'll play a game of chess. Nan nodded her head and released Clara's shoulder. Okay, she said. Clara leaned down and kissed her great-grandmother's cheek. Her mother was waiting at the top of the attic stairs. What was that about, she said, when Clara had closed the door behind herself. I swear that woman gets stranger and stranger every year. Clara didn't reply. She followed her mother down the stairs to the kitchen. I need you to help your father with the cake for tomorrow. He's beside himself with stress. He wants everything to be perfect. Later, Gordon was waiting outside Clara's room. Can I help you? Clara said. She pushed past him and into her room. There was no sign of his sleazy friend, Patrick. In her room, Clara grabbed the bloodied sweater off the chair and tossed it into the hamper, so Gordon couldn't see. She'd have to remember where it was. She couldn't wash it with the rest of her clothes. What were you and Nan doing outside my room, Gordon said. Why were you naked? I didn't mean to embarrass you, Clara said. Nan gets confused sometimes. You know that. I woke up and she was wandering around. I was helping her get back to her room. I didn't think anyone was going to be peeping at us. I'm surprised your little friend didn't run for his camera. Gordon's face flushed. Clara pulled the sheets off her bed and began to shake them out. I went up to have breakfast with Nan this morning, Gordon said. She just looked at me like I was an ant or a slug. I already had breakfast with her, Clara said. I always have breakfast with her. You know that. I know, but I thought maybe it would be okay if I did for once. Mom's always talking about how she's going to die soon. I just thought that... He looked over his shoulder and then shrugged. Never mind. When you go to the grocery store today, can I get a drive into town? For the rest of the day, Clara found her mind drifting into that chess table and to Nan's promise that she had a gift for her. Why would she give Clara a gift on her own birthday? Was she just confused again? She usually visited her grandmother at nine o'clock, but tonight she put it off, hour after hour. She wanted to be there at midnight when her great-grandmother turned 100. She wanted to be the only one there. By the time quarter to twelve rolled around, Clara was more than happy to pull on a stuffy nightgown and button each button right up to the throat. She walked heavily on the attic steps so that her grandmother could hear her approach. And when she reached the top step, she knocked as loud as she could. She pounded. Nan, she said. She pushed the door open and stepped into the room. The chessboard was set up, the black and white pieces all in place, and Nan sat at the chair facing the board, hooked to her iron lung. The thing hissed rhythmically in the quiet room. Hiss, click, hiss, click. Clara smiled at her great-grandmother. Nan, does it feel any different to be a hundred? But as Clara approached, she saw that her grandmother was not moving. She must have fallen asleep waiting.
Clara leaned down to touch Nan's shoulder, bracing herself for the shock when Nan jumped. Her fingers pressed through the soft material of the shirt into the skin that felt hard as bone. This close, Clara could see that Nan's good eye was open, but unblinking. Nan, Clara said. She shook the shoulder roughly, and her grandmother began to lean sideways, the body off balance. Clara clutched at the shoulder but couldn't get a grip on the material. Her fingers were wet with sweat. Her great-grandmother toppled sideways onto the floor, landing on her neck with a quiet crunching sound, like her grandmother chewing cereal. Clara was out the door and downstairs before she realized what was happening. Everything was blurred through her tears. She found her mother and father sitting in front of the television with Gordon and the baby. Nan, she said. Nan isn't moving. Her father climbed to his feet and lifted the remote to put the television on mute. He closed his eyes. Clara's mother stood too. I'll come with you, she whispered, and he nodded. She put her hand on his shoulder. Gordon was staring at Clara in silence. You stay here, Karen told them both. She laced her fingers into her husband's and they went upstairs together. For a long time, neither Gordon nor Clara spoke. They sat on the floor with the television on mute and they listened to the baby's breathing. Gordon's watch beeped midnight. It broke the silence. He turned to look at Clara. Is she dead, Gordon said. Nan? He didn't wait for the answer. When I went to have breakfast with her this morning, I told her that maybe we could spend some time together. I don't know what to say, I said. I love you, and I thought maybe we can have breakfast. And she shook her head and said, It's too late, Gordon. That was all. That was all she would say to me. Clara wiped tears from her cheek. She reached over and pulled her brother into a hug. He wrapped his arms around her waist and squeezed. He shook. Clara wiped her face again. Upstairs, someone screamed. It was a broken sound, and it lasted maybe a second. Gordon and Clara were on their feet before it was done. Someone was pounding down the attic stairs, and Clara ran to the door of the living room. She could hear the sound of her mother crying before Karen appeared at the top of the stairs and caught her foot in the banister. Her face was bright red. She toppled head over heels down the stairs toward them and Gordon opened her arms to catch her. He stepped up onto the bottom step, and she crashed into him full force. She, Claire's mother said, she. But before she could finish the sentence, there was another scream from upstairs, and Clara and Gordon and Karen all turned to look. Nan stood at the top of the stairs, her head hanging to the side so that it rested on her shoulder. The angle was too sharp and white bone protruded from her neck, shining. Her nightgown was dark with stains. Karen shoved Gordon off of her and tried to climb to her feet. Her ankle was twisted, though, and she fell down again. Gordon and Clara sat quietly, watching as their nan began to climb down the stairs, her head swinging in the dark. Her one good eye was white and wide. The fingers that held gently to the banister looked stained with ink. Clara took Gordon's hand and squeezed. Karen was almost to the kitchen door now. She pushed it open and crawled through just as Nan reached the bottom step. Clara opened her mouth to say something. Gordon and Clara watched as Nan walked past them, limping severely on her bad leg. She moved almost without a sound. There was only the soft scrape of her bad foot and the gentle grinding of the bones in her neck. They could see that her nightgown and hands were covered in blood. She lifted her hand to the kitchen door and pushed through after Karen. The two siblings sat in silence, listening. There was no sound from the kitchen. We have to go, Clara said. She climbed to her feet and tried to think of something sensible to do. Nothing seemed right. She wanted to turn all the lights on, but they were already on. Simon, her baby brother... Gordon, we have to get Simon. We have to run away. They ran to the living room where the television was still playing mutely. Simon was gone. There was a loud crash and then a sound like something was hammering. The sound wouldn't stop. It was relentless. On the television, a man was kissing a woman passionately. Where is he? Gordon said. He was right here. Where is he? He got down on his hands and knees. 
He can't have crawled far. He looked under the couch. Simon? He said. Simon? Gordon lifted one of the cushions. We're being ridiculous, Claire said. We have to go. We have to run. The door to the driveway was through the kitchen. Gordon was lifting the second cushion on the couch. We have to go, Gordon. Clara grabbed his wrist and pulled him until he climbed to his feet. They crept back toward the kitchen. Nan was standing in the doorway. A kitchen knife jutted out of her side just above the hip. Nan, Gordon said. There was something wrong with his voice. He choked on the word, and Clara pulled him toward the stairs leading upward. Behind them, Nan began to cough. Blood spat out of her lips onto the front of her gown and the floor. She took a dragging step towards them and then another. With every step her great-grandmother took, Clara felt closer to screaming. She could feel it welling up inside of her, but it wouldn't come. She couldn't make herself scream. It just kept growing and growing with each scraping step the broken old woman took toward them. Then Nan stopped. She turned toward the living room, and Clara heard the soft gurgling of baby Simon. Nan began to scrape into the living room, and Gordon and Clara came down off the steps and followed her. Simon had crawled behind the television, and Nan reached down her thin arm and lifted the television off the ground like a tea cozy. She rolled it aside, and the television burst against the wall, showering glass. Nan reached next for Simon, lifting the baby up by one leg. Her other hand wound into her own hair and lifted her head up onto its broken neck. Her mouth opened, drooling blood and chunks onto the carpet, and it continued to open, stretching like a snake's, the whole head opening and flexing so that the mouth was a foot from top lip to bottom. Gordon was crying. He was squeezing Clara's hand so hard that she could feel bones inside rolling against themselves. She couldn't look away from her great-grandmother. Nan's teeth were stretching up and out of her head, rolling and grinding. The sound was like professional boxing without the crowd, just the beat of flesh and the crackle of bone and cartilage. Nan lowered Simon into her mouth. He didn't cry. Clara and Gordon ran. Gordon kicked the door to the kitchen open, and they both stumbled into the brightly lit room. There was blood and hair all over the floor, but their mother was gone. There was a sound on the front hallway by the door, and Gordon said, Oh, thank God. The door opened, and Nan stepped into the kitchen. Her head was still hanging to the side, and now there was a huge bulge in her neck, a baby-sized bulge. Blood had soaked her nightgown, and the wet material clung to the old woman's breasts. She was grinning, and blood ran in a trickle up her dangling head. Her hair was dark with it. I have a present for you, Nan whispered. Clara felt like the wind was knocked out of her. She felt Gordon's hand around her wrist. My room, Gordon said. They turned and ran again. Upstairs in Gordon's room, Clara helped him push his dresser in front of the door. They sat down on the edge of his bed and Clara began to cry. Gordon put his arm around her shoulders, but he shook worse than she did. He wiped his eyes and stood up. Okay, we need a weapon, Gordon said. I have a baseball bat and my hunting knife. Which do you want? Clara shook her head. She couldn't get her wind back. We can't just hide, Gordon said. We have to fight our way out of here, to the front door. Once we get outside, we'll be safe. We can run. It's her birthday, Clara said. She's a zombie, Gordon said. We have to assume there's more of them. The whole town could be zombies. He trailed off and lifted his hand to his throat. Clara stood up. Gordon, she said. He shook his head at her and motioned at the window behind her. Clara turned and there was Nan, clinging to the side of the house with a grin on her face. The wind blew her head back and forth. Clara realized that she wasn't smiling. Her teeth were growing. The window burst inward and Nan was on top of Gordon, tearing his face and throat with her fingers. Clara covered her face against the slick, wet sounds and when the boxing sounds of teeth started up again, she began to cry. Then there was silence. She felt a hand on her shoulder, gentle and thin. Clara, Nan said, and Clara opened her eyes. Nan's nightgown was torn at the throat, and her head still hung down to the side. Clara, she said again, 
and Clara shook her head. Gordon was gone. His shoes were there on the floor, but there was no body. She felt the insane urge to look inside the sneakers. Nan, Clara said. When I was 22, Nan said, my great-grandmother turned 100 and she told me a story. Her voice was a wet-sounding whisper. She sat me down and played a chess game, and she told me a story. At the end of the story, she asked me what I wouldn't do to live for a hundred years. Nan sat down on the floor beside Clara, and with one of her hands, she pulled her own head up by the hair so that it faced her great-granddaughter. Her squinty eye was caked with blood. This isn't happening, Clara said. She closed her eyes and Nan slapped her. The fingernails that remained on her hand left scratches. The other fingers left streaks of blood. Gordon's blood. Her father's blood. I promised you a birthday present, Nan said. You were supposed to be here hours ago. We were going to play chess. I was going to tell you a story like she told me a story. She told me how she lived so long. Nan's voice faded in and out. Clara felt bile in the back of her throat. Her great-grandmother's bad eye was rolling around beneath the lid, and a white liquid was oozing down her cheek. Nan's teeth didn't stay still the way that teeth should. She told me that when it was her birthday, she would die and come back, and that she would have no choice but to kill and eat everyone, the whole family, except for one girl. Nan's head slipped out of her grip and fell onto her chest. There was a popping sound from her neck. Her hand gripped her hair again and lifted the head. There was blood under her nose. She could leave one girl alive, Nan said, to be her heiress. That girl would live to be a hundred, and the cycle would continue. Clara's great-grandmother coughed, and a tooth fell with a wet sound on the bed beneath them. Clara stared at it. I didn't realize then what it would mean to lose your friends one by one. I didn't realize how tempting it would be to start a family. Everything just seemed to happen. I was suddenly surrounded by people I loved, and they were having families of their own. I had no control over them. Nan's good eye was wide and sad, and Clara didn't know what to do. The old woman's neck was tearing away from her body. Her face was torn and caked with blood. Her bad eye rolled and rolled in its socket. This wasn't her grandmother. You killed them, Clara whispered. You ate them. She closed her eyes so that she didn't have to look at the creature beside her. She let the sobs shake her body. I'm going to kill my family too, aren't I? She said. She lifted her head and looked into her great-grandmother's good eye. I'm going to be a monster like you. No, Nan said. With her free hand, she tried to take hold of Clara's fingers. Clara pulled away. I didn't eat your mother, Nan said. I didn't kill her. I locked her up in the basement. I needed time alone with you. I had to explain. Clara tried to pull away, but Nan's free hand was on her shoulder, now digging into the flesh. The fingers were strong. Explain what, Clara said. This is my gift, Nan said, and her fingers squeezed harder. Clara's collarbone shattered. Her eyes went wide. I couldn't bear it, Nan said. I couldn't put you through this, Nan said. I love you, Clara. She leaned down to kiss Clara on the cheek. The girl had gone unconscious. Nan opened her mouth wider and wider, and her teeth began to stretch and grind. I love you, creepy dog, that always follows you.